part session will be on reducing on-site time and increasing the accuracy of your asphalts, building productive asphalt workflows to increase the design capabilities. I have with me today Sean Solomon. He's one of our application engineers specializing in architecture and most recently scanning. And then, yeah, I'm here joined with Guilebo Kile, amazing AE at uh, Modena. Um, you know, every magician needs a, a beautiful assistant, so I'm the beautiful assistant today. <laughs> uh, so thank you guys for joining us, and yeah. we, can, we can get things rolling. All right, we're going to jump right into it. The topics for today, we're going to start from the good old days, from back in the day when we started doing ice builds, the horse and pony days. We're going to look at what it looks like to embrace the change, what you need to be fully kitted, and what the future holds. So in the good old days, everything took time. In the past, the most common way of gathering asphalt data was taking your measuring tape, going onto a site, sketch pad, pencil in hand, if you were lucky, maybe a camera phone, and you sketch it up. And how we gauge that we've done a really good job was basically like how tired I am means my work is probably concise, right? But you get back to your office, draw it out, get to the end of everything, and you're sitting with about a meter space between the end of your drawing. Mm -hmm. And that then leads, leads to, I have to go back on site, I have to spend money again, I have to spend time, which is money, and it was just tedious. The next move we made was to lasers, which made things a lot easier. Yeah, like Lebo said, you know, we have so much technology now, but back then you'd use a measuring tape, a laser, you take a photo. I'm sure you guys have counted bricks before. Uh, measure photo <laughs> one, 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 one. I mean, this is not an exact science, but all of that effort went into creating asphalt. And those asphalts weren't fairly accurate because it was only as reliable as we were on site. And then that's kind of the purpose of what we want to talk about today. Yes, so with the laser meter, that's when we started moving kind of in the right direction. Not as much physical work and a little bit more accurate. So we're beginning to save time at this stage. Now we need to start embracing change. I know a lot of our golden oldie designers from back in the day, we come through and we say, how about you automate your processes? I'm not saying get a robot into your office to do all work. Automate your processes by moving onto a BIM platform. Once you've gathered your data on site and you capture it on a BIM platform, it makes it so much more malleable. You can share it with your different disciplines. Once you have it, you can add information to it to make it smarter BIM objects, BIM models. And then also, once you're collaborating with other teams, you have now moved from the most rudimentary side of design, which is your CAD design, 2D. It's basically the lines that you drew into a space where you can collaborate with teams that are halfway across the world. Yeah, so Talking to collaborating with your other professionals, your other consultants, why do you need to collaborate to begin with? Well, as well as, like I said, are fairly inaccurate, and this, this new technology allows us to go and make these designs accurate. You know, as time goes on, a building's life cycle changes. It could be anything from the condition changing to informal renovations, things that aren't documented. And to track this information becomes a nightmare. You don't want to go back to site 10 times just to find out that there's an extra room that turns out to not be a room at all, or it's an open opening that you never saw on your plans. So the idea of scanning and taking it into stuff like ACC, BIM 360, is to give you a single source of truth, truth where all consultants can collaborate, can see the information you're seeing without anything being left to interpretation. And, and the importance of Asbos is when a building exists for a long period of time, it tends to change the, the actual nature of the building. I mean, how often do you see a case of a building in town that used to be a hospital is now apartments? And to keep track of this, it's next to impossible. I mean, how many times would you want to go to site? Um, and if this technology can save you a, a drive to site or to turn your drawing to the left just to see if it's the right measurements, that's what we're all for. Yes, so when we do preach about automation, you'll get a lot of people saying, but what exactly will I need that specific license for? Am I buying an entire bunch of licenses just to do one thing that would automate my systems. And I'd say because of the offering that the AEC, the AEC uh, Autodesk has, you can pick and choose what it is that you need to optimize your space. When you do that, 
it's going to move your as-built workflows over by leaps and bounds. Your time is gonna get saved, your accuracy will be increased, and then you get to a point where your turnover is, which is the bottom line that we all want to actually see, increase and our productivity. That way you don't feel like everybody's just sitting in the office clicking away, but nothing is actually getting done. So having access to collaborative software and receiving and relaying data on these foundations is what will help your workflows become smarter. But once you have that BIM modeling software, once you have that platform, are you fully kitted? Because with Insight, what we're trying to do is, yes, we can move to the technologies that are available right now, but what does the future look like? We are gonna have a battle of the scans later on in the day, and this is, this is just a view on what our scans do to also work into your workflows that have to do with your aspects. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so here we have an image of our Pharaoh scanner point cloud. And Sean, if you can explain how that kind of works. Okay, cool. So like Leopold said, you know, this technology is amazing, but it's only as good as how we use it. And so what you're looking at here is a point cloud. And this is done by uh, a laser scanner or a ferro scanner. This uses infrared with LiDAR in combination to create millions of points that form a cloud in the sense. So these millions of points that form a cloud is the building. It starts to form the shape of the building. But where we start to find challenges is how do we interpret this data? I mean, it's amazing technology, but times are old. We still have to, it still relies on us to actually draw it out. Um, it can't create itself. And that's where these workflows come from. So like Levo said, you can send these stuff to the cloud where anybody can access it and collaborate. But a lot of the times what we do is we keep it in our office and we draw them up. We take it into softwares like Robert, AutoCAD, um, and we start to redesign and we start to kind of work off of these point clouds to make it possible that other consultants can work on it with us. Point clouds are, are millions of points, so nobody can start drawing the points. I know, I'm sure you guys played that game before. Imagine doing this with 11 million points. It gets very long, very tedious. So it makes consultants' lives a lot easier when you show them where a wall is and where the window opening is, and they, they're, off, they're off to the races. Yeah. I genuinely like to think of it as little pixels in the picture that can snap to a ribbon wall, because that makes my life a lot easier. <laughs> we also have the Matterpot scanner. And Sean is also going to explain how that one works as well. So the, the difference between the two scanners, and I feel like you guys have sat here like for most of the day, so you guys might know this more than me at this point, but Matterport and Faro, these scanners, they, they hit two different marks. Faro is very high on data, while Matterport is very high on visual. So with a Matterport um, scan, you're looking at something as an end product that you can show up to clients, where with the Faro data, you'd be looking at it for yourself and other consultants to work on, to draw, to annotate, and so on. Now, the idea of the workflow is you would go to site, you would take your scanner with you, you would scan the site. Now, depending on how, many, how long it's gonna take you to scan, will really depend on the complexity of the building, how many scans you need. But once that data is collected, you would then take it back and register it, put it together, and that's how you form a point cloud. Now, that point cloud then gets taken into Rivet or any software that you wanna work with. And something I want to preface is we're speaking a lot about architecture because that's where our backgrounds lie, but it actually, as well speaks to anything that's been created, fabricated, constructed, manufactured, reverse engineering is also a very big thing of how as both work. You scan a machine or you scan a component and then you redesign it on Inventor. And the idea of this is to keep a life cycle of projects or keep a life cycle of things that exist. Um, I know end users often find a problem where they have a piece of machinery or they go to a new building and they have no idea what's hidden behind the ceiling boards, what's underneath the floors. And that's what the point of these scanners are, to allow them to keep this life cycle of the building. So we would take these point clouds into Rivet, redraw it and redesign it, but also inspect it. We'll also see where are structural issues, where is the building dilapidated, things like that. And we see how can we reconstruct it, how can we kind of give, us, give our clients this peace of mind of how the buildings actually sound. Maybe it's eight years old, but it's still a sound structure. And we show that to the point because we give them hard data that they can go and take to their stakeholders and represent it as, this is what you're buying, this is what you're designing on top of. So the main factor, why well, you mentioned that we are based in architecture, we always make reference to building and so on. With our ferro scanner, we have one of our guys who's actually scanning mines. So it does go to that extent. You can grab information from a vast space like a mine with your voids being captured and recreate them in your re uh, reverse engineering. Going beyond this, we want to see what the future holds. 
me personally, I feel like with point clouds and the relation back to Rivet, a lot of clients come back to me and say, so is Rivet going to draw it for me? I feel like this might be the next step. <laughs> and I don't know how you feel, but once we get to a space where our automation is at a point where I can maybe write a dynamo script that will pick up my point cloud and actually place walls to snap to the singular points that I've placed, I'll be working smarter and not harder. I completely agree with you, Lebo. I think um, a lot of the cases are you get a point cloud and they say, is this my model? And you're like, nope, I'm only starting with your model now. <laughs> so the idea is yeah, to the future of Asbos would be to have it automated. To use software like Faro has a, a plugin called Asbos on the nose, I know, but it gets the job done. And it's meant to kind of process this data faster for you. So you just snap points. Instead of you now basically tracing a point cloud, you start to just pick points and it starts to recreate this point cloud. Now, that's all great. And that comes from the more we use it, the more this technology will advance. The more we use point clouds, the more a need to automate it becomes, and then the need for automation becomes how do we kind of regulate this and how do we keep track of what's being created. Now, this is, that's what we need you guys to do. We need you guys to go out there and find how do we use point clouds, you know? How could this make my job easier? How can I take this and show it to other stakeholders and show them, listen, you're getting so much more than just a whole bunch of million points. You're getting hard data that you can use. And I think that's the future of point clouds. I mean, we like to think that we try to do this stuff so we don't have work anymore, so we can focus on other things. Um, I mean, I can only refresh my email so many times in a day. So. <laughs> but, I mean, just, just an anecdote. Also, you know, time is money. I was really scanning the Charlotte McKeke Hospital last year, and we had a Leica, like a big thing. It's almost like, you know, quite three surveys. We're carrying this thing around, going from hospital to hospital, and from room to room in the hospital. And we only got, we only did part of hospital A. And then other people came in with these like super high tech scans you just walk around with, you know? Um, so, um, time wise, I mean, I'm looking forward to the technology advancing. Uh, look, definitely. The more we use it, the more challenges we face, and then we can bring those forward to the people that create it. Again, we're the users, and there's people out there like Faro and Matterport that actually put um, research, they put time, money, and research to kind of create these things to be as efficient as possible. And when you face challenges, you know, they can't plan for everything. It's up to us. I like to say, like, we like to break the mold, because then they can reform it and give us something brand new for this. So it's definitely a good sentiment to have. Yes, and I always encourage a lot of the students that come to the training because we also offer training. I always encourage them, join your Autodesk forums. Like, go into the little questions, type in your knowledge questions, space. get your, your knowledge space, get the responses back, give your suggestions. I want Rivet to be able to do this for me next year. I want uh, maybe a structural plugin to be added because they're so most, more so focused on the architectural part of things. But let your voice be heard because we are the people that build the software that's going to make things easier for ourselves. So we can open up the floor to questions, or more questions now. Questions, sorry, just to be fun, your Matterport and your, is, is it two? Yes. No, is it two different scanners? Are they both static scanners? No. Uh, well, one is an infrared with LiDAR and one is photogrammetry with infrared. Yeah, so they're both static. In other words, you have to set up your, your different points. Oh, yes, yeah, so, so it, yeah, it doesn't move on its own, it doesn't automate, so you can't put it down. I mean, maybe if you hook it up to a remote control car, but really yeah, you have to move. Because, like, I mean, you can get mobile scanners now. Right? Yeah, so with the Faro, with the Faro we <coughs> had uh, at the construction expo. Yeah, that's what? Well, squat, so, uh, the little roller dog, and you can place it on it for spaces like in mines where people can't necessarily access that far into yes, the mine. Yeah. They will walk the camera in and capture the data. So it's kind of static, but you can mobilize it. Okay, it's going to be around more often, I'm hoping. It was a real crowd grab. Right? We blow a budget on the paella. And <laughs> Maybe next year, next year. We'll be yes, sir. Are, are there underwater applications? Like, yeah, so scanning, it's not just uh, stuck to the ground. There's also a drone. There's also um, underwater ones. We mostly focus on the, the ones that are above ground. So you're just your usual, um, like she said, static sta uh, scanners. You place them wherever you want information to be put. Something to remember is it's like a camera. It sees what you see. So you can't expect it to see something behind the wall or hidden behind something. You'd have to move the scanner to be visible. 
But there's definitely a lot of different scanning options. Um, it also depends how do you want to extract this data, because in the mining industry, they've been using this technology for quite a long time, and they seem to have mastered ways of pulling this information. Um, in terms of architecture stuff, it's still fairly like rudimentary for us. Like I said, we trace it. You can imagine if you have a million plus points, why are you still tracing stuff? Um, that's because to pick one point out of a million is a hard task to do. And that's the whole uh, challenge of why we try to push this. It's like, we can, we can trace it for you, but the more challenging, uh, the more you use it and the more challenges you face, the more we can start to kind of move and navigate and say, what works best? You know, how can we get this product to you as fast as possible? Um, the least amount of complications, and yeah, it gives you the data. You make the most of the data. Once you've scanned a space, uh, I think it's, it's often, often uh, as builds are often like uh, attached to old buildings, buildings that you'll buy and they've been around for 80 plus years, heritage buildings. Yeah. But what if you start uh, actually creating an as well as soon as a uh, building has been constructed? You start to create that documentation early on. I mean, how often do you go to council and they don't have the plans? Now you have to go and measure it up and scan. If you can start, yeah, sorry, if you can, go and add this to ACC, to BIM, these cloud platforms where it's, it's life, its life cycle is being documented. Yeah. 50 years from now, when they change, try to change that clinic into an apartment, they already have the data. It saves them time to go back, and rather they can focus on more important things in that project. They also said, yeah, yeah. It, it, sorry, it's, um, yeah, so you can go first and okay. the gentleman. Um, so if I look at the, at the products we've now discussed with the new analysis before, am I right in saying, um, the logical implementation of the theme, start with point cloud and get the relics done. Okay? Because then you've got a model, you've got a 3D model, and you've got the, the building. Okay? But you don't necessarily have the exact models and makes of the assets that you scan. Okay? So you would need something else to go and do that. Either people running around pasting barcodes and then write it wrongly, incorrectly, and bring it to you. Rightly, wrongly, and differently, but can we then, from there, go into like a matter for scanner who makes it more elegant and gives me the dimensions and put that into the Revit model and it becomes more usable? Is that a logical flow? Sort so, of. So, so can, yeah, yeah okay. the one can, both can complete the requirement that you're asking for, capturing yeah. the elements with scanner is more so linear-based, if I'm not mistaken. So, yeah, to kind of answer your question, you, you, you're kind of asking, can you layer two scanners on top of each other to provide more yes. information? Yes. Well, the idea is the, the Faro actually picks up so much of detail that it's not required, but now if you talk about assets, I'm assuming you mean furniture um, or equipment? No, I'm talking about equipment. Equipment, so on. Yeah. So the idea would be that you take into, um, you'd, it'll work the exact same way as you do with a building. You'd scan equipment, like fire equipment, and you would create a model out of it. Now, you know, I don't like creating five rooms. I don't know how five equipment works. But you, you pull a family in and you put it as a placeholder. But then when you go to the fire engineer, you say, look, you need to replace this placeholder with an actual fire. What is spec for this building? And that's the idea. But now, with the Matterport, that's a visual. So we like to talk about Matterport in the sense of it's the pretty picture of this, this um, thing. It's like the Pharaoh's the scientific calculator, while the Matterport is just one plus one. Because one plus one equals a great picture, and everyone's happy, and they go home. So the Matterports are more for guys that are in the real estate. They want a, they want kind of like this nice visual. They want to see something. You'll yeah, they, they want the iPhone of scanners. You'll they want something yeah. easy. You don't need training, and you don't need too much of. You can see your mistakes with the Matterport. It's fairly obvious when your table doesn't look nice or there's coffee spilled on it. Pharaoh, you're not going to know what points are making up there. So it takes some time and some training to actually equate yourself with what are you looking at? What is the difference of the data that I'm getting? So the idea is, and I, and I understand it. it you would want to create a digital twin in the sense, almost an exact replica of what is existing on site. Now, that speaks to a level of detail, which is the LOD. And those LOD standards, you know, they, they go up to 600. So you're looking at LOD 200 is very rudimentary. You're putting in walls, and it's um, not even the finishes. You're just saying walls. You don't know if it's plastered and painted, what's happening there, it's concrete. Then we start to go up in your LOD levels to 300, 400. You start to actually put in specifications. You start to talk about um, how is it constructed, some detail. So I, I think, you know, the scanners can't solve everything, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, no, um, but I think the more you work with it, the more you create a library of assets that you can just kind of plug them in where you need them. Um, yeah, I think. But tying it back to the actual presentation, once you've captured all that information, and you want your assets to be captured, and you get to a level of detail where you have a digital twin, yes. your assets can actually be made smart with the Revit program. Like 
Sean was saying, as was the union looked at for when you're just taking over old buildings, where we should actually be looking at avoiding the same situation we had in Unitoria. We're still trying to find some plans from there. We burned down, and everybody's just like, you just don't have to build from scratch, and now it's my next step. Rather than we create a library of digital information that's never going to get lost. Talking to Spot, that's like a million there. Yeah. And that's yeah, just yeah. so he walks a couple of steps. Is that the but Matterport? Standard? No, 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 that's the yeah. Pharaoh. I think yeah. the Matterport, and so I don't quote him in this, I think it's around seventy to 80,000 for the Matterport. Well, okay. um, yeah, the Pharaoh is the, the more expensive one. But, uh, and, and price is always a factor. Look, uh, you know, in architecture, in any construction, yeah. you know, that, that weighs down your project. And we always look at, okay, how do we disperse these costs? Um, Telling a client I've spent half a million on a scanner and this is your disbursements isn't gonna go so well, right? Yeah. Um, and that's kind of like where we, as a, as a you know as a team or as professionals, need to come together and say, okay, how do we make this work? How do we use this technology? When you start using technology, it becomes random and no one uses it anymore. It's great to have half a million on a scanner, but if no one scans with it, its value is almost zero. Um, and that's the idea. The idea is for us to you know, work with these things, um, go in and apply them and say, okay, these, this is the practical and the, the value of it. Now, yes, I can, go and st I can go measure this building myself. It's not gonna be as accurate. Maybe you can get away with it on certain projects, but don't you want this quality? Don't you want this assurance that this data will always be good? Um, you can't argue with data. Um, you know, if your client has a disagreement and says, no, this my, my square meter is supposed to be so big, it's like, well, the data doesn't show it unless you built a secret back room that I didn't see. No, That's the idea. I just see it sort of as a, okay, some people say uh, as built, if you have to do it for a client or for a enterprise or whatever, it's sort of a, a extra income very fast mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah, it's like a, almost a cash cow, it's not a cash cow. Uh, but the, the main thing of that is that uh, make it easier for you and uh, set out the person and then it's, it's, it's cost effective in terms of the pricing of that and that's why I'm asking the question if, if it's cost effective in terms of the, the meta for one, uh, then it is much so better to buy a thing like that. Yes and no, I mean, look, the idea is that we do sell the scanners but we also rent them out and the idea is that you kind of work in a project that you can make it feasible to actually own a scan. Now, again, I can't, I can't really speak to the actual cost implication that's really, you know, it's up to your project, it's up to your clients and so on. But um, I don't feel like you're stuck. I don't feel like you can, it's either, either by one or by the other. It's more, how do I want to use it and when do I want to use it? If I'm going to always use it in my business is scanning, then it makes sense to own a scan. But if your business is to do as well every now, every couple of months, yeah. why not rent it? Or why not even, why even do the as well yourself in this? Yeah. yeah. All right. So where does Leica fit into this? We, we, like, we don't like to talk about Leica. Oh. <laughs> it's like a, a every, as soon as the word comes out, it just blurs. It just like, oh. it's like you just hear static bubbles. Sorry, it's like more expensive. Um, to be honest, I can't, I can't actually, I don't actually know where it sits in the cost range. Um, again, it's a competitor between the scanners that we sell in the sense of Faro. Um, but yeah, no, look, I encourage you guys, that's the point of the open day is to meet us outside again. There's more. There's more people that's better than me at talking about this stuff. I'm sure you guys are tired of hearing me talk for like, I don't know how long I've been talking. But yeah, come meet us outside. We'll, you guys want to know the cost, you want to know the hard way. And again, we're having another talk at the end of the day with the two scanners. Then you can see the two, the two scanners go up against each other. Um, you can kind of see where's the give and take. What do I get for the money I'm paying for and the, where does it make sense for me? Uh, just, a, yeah, so just a reminder that it's a CPD so you guys can scan. That's how you level. No, I was going to ask for any more questions, but they're still fine. Yeah, sorry guys, any more questions? Are you guys happy? I think it's 900 pounds. For the fabric. Oh, the light. We, we use the light. Okay, 360. Yeah. Uh, scanned about 1,300 square meters in about 15, 20 minutes. But that's, is that open space now? Open 1,000? So what? With the, what, what it did is, we just walked around the building. Yeah, yeah. It, it gave, us, gave us a point cloud, data file, and it's built. The only downside is 
Windows, mirrors, it starts to recognize a mirror as a separate room, or when it, when it goes past a, a window, it starts to change that, that it bends the lasers. What happens is that data is no longer accurate. So that's where you, we come in. You, know, you come in and you clean it up. Um, it, yeah, so yeah, can, so, can you, if you've got the point cloud data, are you able to clean that? Then yeah, 100%. Mm -hmm. so, so like with Faro, they have their own software called Scene, and then that's, it, it works perfectly with their data. But you can also take it into something like Portuguese Recap, yeah. where you can you know, cut out spaces that don't seem right, adjust it. That's, that's a big thing why it cannot be an automated system. Again, you need someone that visually can check this information against itself. Um, that's why we're important. You know, technology exists, but it doesn't remove us out of the equation. It just helps us.